Welcome to our worship service this morning at Cornerstone Presbyterian Church. It is great to be back with you. It uh, really is. I, we've wanted to do this for a long time, so I'm glad it finally worked out. I have a couple of announcements uh, here. First of all, plans are moving ahead to pack up the building for our move to New Beginnings Community Church. And we need help in the following ways. There are five here. First, packing up the church. That's from now until August 29th that we'll be packing. Yes, but they're pretty well done. So. What's that? It's, we've, we did a lot yesterday. A lot has been done. That's, that's good. Uh, number two, uh, prepping New Beginnings. That will happen from roughly August 29th, maybe, maybe even a little earlier now. To September 11th. Moving day is the 12th of September. Um, and then reorganizing things there from September 14th through 25th. And then there's going to be a community giveaway on September 26th. Check your email for sign up for each of those things. Uh, many hands make the work lighter. And you can speak with Sarah McDonald or Lois Sorkness if you want more specific details about timing and what specific tasks need to be completed. Uh, also, next announcement, we will be welcoming into membership on August 30th the following people, Timothy and Carla Crawford, Noah Zare, and Morgan Zook. So looking forward to that, uh, that event on the 30th. And then the annual meeting will also be on the 30th after the morning worship service. So plan accordingly. I guess that's live. Is that correct, Sandy? So we'll actually be here for that. Uh, and then uh, two more things. After the benediction today... Just stay seated. Uh, we're going to dismiss by rows anyway, but also uh, Sandy has just a brief announcement from the session uh, right after the benediction. So stay, stay seated for that. And then please join us for evening worship at 6 tonight. We will be celebrating the Lord's Supper together this evening. Now, with those announcements out of the way, let's take just a couple of moments and prepare our hearts to approach the Lord in worship. Please stand and hear God call us to worship from his word. These are the words of Psalm 95. It says this, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his. For he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Let's join our voices in worship, using the words of Psalm 98. This is hymn 98a, O sing a new song to the Lord.
great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to come into your presence with our voices of praise. We ask that you would be with us as we worship you. We ask that you would teach us, that you would instruct us. But we ask especially that you would find our worship acceptable in your sight. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, let's uh, confess our faith together. We'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed. These are printed in the, uh, in the bulletin. Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you have uh, your copy of the scriptures with you, I'd invite you to turn there. I'll read the whole chapter. This is Psalm 67, beginning in verse 1 and going through verse 7. It begins this way, the choir master with stringed instruments, a psalm, a song. And this is the word of God. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Well, having that revelation of God's goodness to us, we now come to him and confess our sins together. We'll do this praying together using the words that are printed in the bulletin that are adapted from the Strasbourg liturgy. Let's pray together. O Lord God, eternal and almighty Father, we confess and sincerely acknowledge before your holy majesty that we are poor sinners, conceived and born in iniquity and corruption, prone to do evil, incapable of any good, and that in our depravity we transgress your holy commandments without end or ceasing. Therefore, we purchase for ourselves, through your righteous judgment, our ruin and and perdition. Nevertheless, O Lord, we are grieved that we have offended you, and we condemn ourselves and our sins with true repentance, beseeching your grace to relieve our distress. O God and Father, most gracious and full of compassion, have mercy upon us in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And as you do blot out our sins and stains, magnify and increase in us, day by day, the grace of your Holy Spirit, that as we acknowledge our unrighteousness with all our heart, we may be moved by that sorrow, which shall bring forth true repentance in us, mortifying all our sins, and then producing in us the fruits of righteousness and innocence which are pleasing to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now hear these words of assurance from the Word of God, from 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 52, Man of Sorrow. <clears throat> Whoa. 
join our hearts together now in prayer. Our great and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you with the full knowledge that you are aware of all our needs and that you are good and that you are for us. We thank you that you know us better than we know ourselves. You care for us in ways that go far beyond the ways in which we could care for ourselves. We thank you that not a hair falls from our head without you knowing about it. And so it's because of our confidence in your fatherly love and care and sovereignty over all things that we come before you now. We also acknowledge that the only reason that we can come to you with our requests, sinners that we are, is because of the work of Christ on our behalf. We thank you that we have such a Savior. We thank you that he not only has made atonement for our sins, but ever lives to intercede on our behalf. We thank you for the high priestly ministry of Jesus. And we thank you for the great promises of his return, promises in which we hope today. Father, you have been very good and gracious to us. You've been gracious to us as a church. We thank you even for the recent mercies that you've bestowed upon us in giving us favor with our landlord and enabling us to move to a location that will be more suitable and will allow us to be better stewards of the resources you've entrusted to us. We pray that we wouldn't forget this kindness that you've shown us, this way in which you have providentially worked in the life of our church. We thank you for the many provisions you've made in other ways. We thank you for the provision of our session here, for the godly men who serve and who care for us. We thank you for the provision of this new ministerial advisor. We thank you for Dr. Van Dixorn's wisdom and his care. We thank you for the deacons whom you've given to us. We thank you for the many tangible ways in which they've been able to minister in the midst of this difficult situation. Father, we have much to be grateful for, and yet when we look at our own lives and even look at our nation, we also have many concerns. We ask that you would be with uh, the governing authorities at the federal level and at the state level and at the local level. They've been entrusted with very weighty responsibilities. We pray that you would give them wisdom, that they would be spiritually minded. We know that you've put them in these positions for this time. We know that you've commanded us, uh, unless it violates your law, to be submissive to them. And we pray that we would do that, but we pray that you would also be with them, that they would make decisions that would be for the good of the commonwealth, for the good of those of us who are citizens. We pray for our nation, which is struggling in many ways, but perhaps most acutely with the effects of this virus. We ask that you might, in your wrath and judgment, remember mercy that you would be gracious to us, that you would remove the effects of this in whatever way you see fit. We ask that in the midst of these difficulties, in the midst of these challenges, you would be at work in each of our lives for our sanctification. We pray that you'd cause us to grow in holiness, to grow in Christ-likeness, to grow in humility and submission to you, to grow in our trust in you, to grow in our hope for the future. We pray for those who do not know you, many of whom are close to us, but far from you. We ask that in your kindness, you would draw them to yourself. May they cling to Christ in this time. We ask as well that you would be with those in our own congregation who are struggling, struggling financially, Struggling with loneliness, struggling with confusion. 
fighting against sin and all these things we know that we have promises from you and we cling to those promises and ask that you would provide you are a good and gracious father to us and we come to you with these needs confident in your goodness confident in your grace and we ask for these things in Jesus name Amen Normally, of course, at this time we would have an offering, but we won't be doing that. I would just refer you to the giving options that you can find online. You turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude. We are going to be looking at the last few verses of this book, uh, the last two verses. But I'll read the whole thing. It's not a long book, of course, as you know. It's just one chapter, and it's printed. The entirety of it is printed in your bulletin. But if you have your copy of God's Word, you can open that. I'll read the whole thing, Jude 1 through 25. And remember, as I read, this is, once again, this is God's Word. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, Beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was, that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, served as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them! For they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, Following their own sinful desires, they are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, 
To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, you've given us your word that we might be instructed, that we might know you, that we might understand ourselves. We thank you for this. We would be in the dark if you hadn't revealed yourself to us. We thank you that your word is alive and active. We thank you that your spirit works through your word. And we ask that he would do his work in our hearts even now. Convict us of sin. Show us the path of righteousness. Train us up. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Perhaps you've had moments in your life, maybe many moments, maybe moments within the last week, where you've been overwhelmed by the number of things that you have to do. Overwhelmed by lists and lists of tasks that you need to perform. I was thinking about this even just in the last week. We returned from a, a short vacation with my family. And it is, it is remarkable the amount of work that has to be done just to prepare to go away and relax. You have to make lists and lists of things to pack and, and what not to do and what not to bring. And, and, and all of our life can be that way. We have this move coming up, this, this church move, and there are lists and lists of things that need to be tackled in order for that to come off successfully. And, and even reading through the book of Jude, we might be struck by the number of things, the number of tasks, the number of activities, the number of duties that, that Jude gives to us. Uh, just a few uh, that you may have noticed as we read through it. At the beginning, he, he tells all of us that we need to contend for the faith that was once delivered. He says that we need to remember the things that we were taught. He says that we need to keep ourselves in certain ways. That we need to build up one another. That, that we need to be praying all the time. That we need to wait and wait patiently for the return of the Lord. That we need to have mercy on some, and that we need to even save others by snatching them out of the fire. That alone, in this one chapter, these 25 verses, is a long list of duties that churches and Christians need to be aware of. You could, you could list out all the imperatives, and, and there they'd be for you. Uh, quite a number of things that we have to be concerned with. And in a sense... That can be overwhelming, just as all of our lists can be a little overwhelming to us. Even this list of duties from Jude can be overwhelming for us. And the question that we would be confronted with when we get to verse 23, after reading all the things that we're supposed to be engaged in, all the very important matters that the church and Christians have to concern themselves with, the question we might ask at the end of verse 23 is just how exactly are we supposed to accomplish all of these tasks? There are a couple ways that people tend to deal with these duties that we see in the New Testament. One way, of course, probably the most prevalent way, maybe this is what you do when you read your Bible, is simply to just forget all that's said. You read through Jude, and you, you know that there may have been a few commands that were given, but you don't take them very seriously. You just gloss over them. You don't actually look and see what it is that's required of the church or that's required of us as individuals. That's, that's perhaps the, the simplest and most prevalent way to deal with the commands of God, to simply forget about them, to distract yourself enough that you pretend that God hasn't told you what to do. We can do this sometimes very selectively. There may be particular commands, particular teachings of Scripture that you'd prefer weren't there. And so you simply distract yourself enough that you pretend they're not there. Of course, that doesn't actually do any good. The words on the page don't change. God's commands don't change just because you want to ignore them. And so these things are here for us. And so it won't do for us to ignore them. And I think that leads us to the second approach that many of us take when we come to the commands of God, as we see the commands of God, and perhaps we, we feel overwhelmed by them. And we may try to give some effort to a few of them here and there, but what we find when we do that is that that can become very discouraging as well, but we need to give effort to them. In fact, effort is implied 
by every one of these commands. Perhaps you've noticed how often in the New Testament, even the Apostle Paul talks about himself and his own life and his own ministry and says, I've worked harder than any of the others, or I make every effort to obey the commands of God. So in a sense, when we read these commands, effort and, and work on our part is an appropriate response, a biblical response. We have to be taking these commands seriously. We can't ignore them. And we have to, the scriptures would tell us, work at them. Make every effort. But the reality is that as we make every effort and as we look and evaluate our own lives, we realize fairly quickly that we as a church and we as individual Christians, despite our efforts, often fall very short of these commands that were given. And that's why these words in verses 24 and 25 are so critically important for us. They're important for each of us as individuals as we look at our own lives and take seriously the commands of God. And they're important for us as a church as we try to think clearly about what it is that God has commanded us to do, how it is that God has commanded us to act toward one another and toward the world. The commands, of course, begin, or the, the, the news that we receive at the end begins in verse 24. Because what we learn in verse 24 is this, and this is perhaps the first fundamental truth of these two verses, that God is the one who is able to do it. But Jude doesn't shy away from commands. He doesn't shy away from giving us a list of things that we have to be about. But he does tell us at the end that ultimately it's God who's going to do it. Now to him who is able is how the verse begins. So we have to ask ourselves when we come to that phrase, who is this God of whom Jude speaks? We have to have a clear picture of who God is in our minds to fully appreciate what Jude says here at the end. And I think we can gain some picture of the God whom, to whom Jude refers, even just by looking at the book of Jude. If we look back a few verses, we see at the beginning, the very first verse of this book, it, Jude tells us that God is the one who has called us to himself. God is the one who calls God is the one who loves us, even in the midst of our sin. Jude tells us that in verse 1 as well. God is the one, Jude tells us, who is keeping us in order to present us to Christ. Oh, but God is also a judge, Jude teaches us. He gives example after example of God, this loving, calling, keeping God, also being a God of justice. A God who can't tolerate sin and who won't tolerate sin. But in the midst of that judgment, he tells us as well that God is one who has given ample warning to his people and even to the world. So his justice is totally righteous in every respect. And we go beyond the book of Jude and ask the question, who is this God to whom Jude refers in verse 24? We might be drawn to the words of the Psalms. Remember what Psalm 145 tells us. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Or remember what the prophet tells us in Isaiah chapter 40. He says this. He asks a series of rhetorical questions. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired his understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. This is the one whom Jude tells us is able to keep you from Stumbling, And that's, of course, the next great truth of these verses. Not only do we have to reckon with the question of who is this God 
to whom Jude refers, but also what is this God going to do in our lives? What does he promise? And this, of course, as well, begins in verse 24. Now that him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. What is this great God, this unsearchable God, this God who never grows tired, this God who has wisdom far beyond our comprehension, this God who is the creator of all things, including us as human beings? What is this God promising to do for his people? Well, Jude says he's promising, he's able to keep you from stumbling. That's the first thing that's noted here. This is actually a highly unusual word that Jude employs here, this word for stumbling. We find it occasionally in other classical Greek sources, and, uh, and, and the, the usual use of it has to do with, uh, with a horse or some kind of other animal not uh, falling over, not, not, not tripping despite the conditions. And that's the word that Jude uses under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here to talk about what the Lord is able to do for you and for me and even for us as a congregation. He's able to keep you from stumbling. Now, what would that look like? Well, I would suggest that there are a number of examples, even in the book of Jude, of what this stumbling might look like. He gives example after example. He begins with the people of Israel. He said the people of Israel were led through the Red Sea. They were read, led by God in the wilderness. And, and yet what happened to them? Well, they, they, they didn't believe. And they were cut down because of that. He gives the example of angels who, who, who also left their proper sphere of authority. He gives the example of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. He gives other examples of, of even false teachers who have crept into the church. All examples of stumbling and falling, and we can look at these examples and even look at examples that you might know more personally, people who are close to you, whom you've seen stumble and fall, and you can become very discouraged, but what Jude reminds us of is the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, the God of all creation, is able to keep you from stumbling. That's not something that you can guarantee of yourself. It's not something that anyone else can do for you, but it is something that the Lord is able to do, Jude says. And secondly, it's as if it gets even better after this. He's not only able to keep you from stumbling, he's able to actually present you blameless before the presence of his glory. This is hard for us to even imagine. Because when you look at yourself or when you look at someone else, there's probably almost nothing about us as individuals that is totally blameless, uh, that is totally spotless. And that's really what the word means. It's a word that's used repeatedly in the book of Leviticus to describe the kind of sacrifices that need to be brought to the tabernacle or to the temple. These sacrifices, you'll remember from your reading of the Old Testament, had to be spotless. They had to be blameless. They had to have no defect, no fault to them. Those are the only kinds of sacrifices the Lord accepted. And it's that exact word that Jude uses here and says, the Lord is able to keep you from stumbling, and the Lord is able to present you completely blameless, completely spotless before his own presence. Think about any aspect of your life is there anything external about your appearance that you would say that is perfect, without blame or spot, no problems at all? Is it, are, there, are there features of your personality that you could honestly say are, are spotless? No, no problems, no difficulties, and no, no, no complaints at all from anyone. When you look at your own spiritual life, you go even deeper. None of us could look at our own hearts and say we are spotless in our affections, in our thoughts, in our desires. No, all of us, of course, sin in many ways. We're reminded of this in the New Testament. If anyone claims he's without sin, John tells us, he deceives himself and the truth is not in him. No, but what does God say here? He says he's the one who's able to present you blameless before his own presence. 
This is really hard for us to even imagine, but it's precisely the reminder we need at the end of a book like Jude. It's precisely the reminder we need when we come to the New Testament and see the many things that are required of us, the great effort that we must expend on behalf of the Lord. Well, of course, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop at blameless. It says he's going to, he's able to present us blameless before the presence of his glory, but not only before the presence of his glory, but before the presence of his glory with great joy. Think about how frequently in your life joy is absent. Think about how much of your life, uh, even in a given day, uh, is spent without any real joy. There are things you have to get done. There are things you have to endure. A real joy is, is a rarity. I was, in, I was listening uh, recently to a, a podcast about baseball, and these baseball executives were saying, you know, what's the real value of what we do, uh, particularly during this time of the pandemic? And one of them said, well, yeah, I think, I think at its best we're able to bring people great joy. Now, I'm a Phillies fan, so it didn't make sense to me. But, but, but I think there's something to that. There is, a, there is a, a kind of joy that we sometimes get, but it's, of course, very superficial and, and very fleeting. But real joy so infrequently characterizes our lives. But, but what, what Jude tells us is uh, what the Lord is able to do for us is something that no one, no circumstance, no experience can ever do, which is he's able to present us without stumbling. He's able to present us blameless with great joy in his presence. It's hard to even imagine what that would be like on that day. It's the kind of joy that we just taste here and there in life very briefly, sometimes very infrequently. And yet it's a sort of foretaste of the kind of thing about which Jude speaks. And then, of course, Jude explains to us how it is that God does all these things. Because he says in verse 25 that this is to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you want to know how it is that you can look forward to being presented before God, blameless with great joy. The only answer, the only answer the Bible gives, and it gives it over and over again, is it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's through his work alone. Jesus is clear about this. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And of course, even if you look at yourself, you know that that must be the case because you know that in and of yourself, no matter how much effort you expend, no matter how hard you try, no matter how many good influences you surround yourself with, you realize you, you could never accomplish what these verses are describing. You never could accomplish this great joy. You could never could accomplish this blamelessness. Well, it's through Christ alone that this happens. There's only one way. It's through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is actually a note that is struck many times in the New Testament. It's remarkable how many times salvation is described in these ways. Ephesians 1 comes to mind where it talks about the great work of salvation that God did. And it said, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. This is... The gospel, this is the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the good news is that not only will he do this, but he has taken it upon himself to accomplish it for us. Remember the words of that hymn, day by day, the protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he lays through the Lord Jesus Christ that all these things happen. And because of that, of course, Jude then reminds us that it's Christ alone who deserves uh, the glory. Here's what he says in the remainder of verse 25. Through the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. And it's at this point we need to ask ourselves, are these the things that you would ascribe 
to the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it the case that in your thinking, in your worship, in your reading of Scripture, you ascribe to the Lord Jesus Christ and to Him alone the glory that He deserves, the majesty that it, it, that is His, the dominion that He alone possesses, and the authority that it, the Word tells us He has? Are these the things that you ascribe to Him in your work and in your actions? And then finally, of course, Jude reminds us of the duration of all of these things, glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. How is it that Christ receives this? When is it that Christ receives this? Well, of course, Jude reminds us it's before all time, it's from eternity past, but it's now as well, and it will be forever in the future. Jesus Christ is as majestic, as in control, as sovereign, as deserving of our own uh, ascription of glory now as he always has been and always will be. And this also, of course, brings us great hope because if these things are true of him now and they will be true of him forever, then we can be confident that he'll be the one to bring to pass that which he's promised. Well, what difference does all of this make for us? I think there are a number of things that this ought to drive home in our thinking as we read through these verses. First of all, I think we need to set these verses in their context and begin by asking ourselves the question that Jude, I think, does drive home in the first 23 verses, which is, are we taking the commands of God seriously in our lives? Uh, do these things uh, matter to us? Do these things weigh heavily on us? Are these our priorities as they are the priorities of the Word of God? That's the first question we need to ask is the perspective of this text, our own perspective. Is it the way you think of your life and what you should be doing? Is it the way you think of our church and what we should be doing? Is it the way that you regard others according to the perspective of the Word of God? And, of course, as we, as we begin to answer that question, that leads us to the hope that is provided here. And our hope for the accomplishment of these things, our hope for the future, our hope for eternity, is all bound up in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done and promises to do for us. There's a wonderful application of this, of course, in, uh, in Paul's own life. When Paul describes his own understanding uh, of, of his own ministry and his own efforts, he says this in Philippians chapter 2, uh, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, take these commands of God seriously. But then he says this, For it's God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Or I mentioned before, Paul's appeal to his own effort. He says things like this, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God working in me. And this, of course, brings us great hope if we are united to Jesus Christ by faith. That he's the one who can do it, and he's the one who promises to do it. Last year, there was a celebration of the canons of Dort, these wonderful articles of faith that were written by many of our forefathers in the faith, and they speak about this. They speak about the glory of these promises. And here's what they say. Listen to these words of comfort. They say this, So it's not by their own merits or strength, but by God's undeserved mercy that they neither forfeit faith and grace totally nor remain in, the downfall, in their downfalls to the end and are lost. It's talking about all of us who struggle in the faith. With respect to themselves, this not only easily could happen, but also undoubtedly would happen. But with respect to God, it cannot possibly happen. God's plan cannot be changed. God's promise cannot fail. The calling according to God's purpose cannot be revoked. The merit of Christ, as well as his interceding and preserving, cannot be nullified. And the sealing of the Holy Spirit can neither be invalidated nor wiped out. 
at a very personal level, of course. We have many who have taken these truths so seriously, particularly in times of suffering, these truths about God's work in preserving his people. There's a wonderful quote about this from Samuel Rutherford, who says this about the, the hope that he has for the future in the midst of great suffering. He says, when we shall come home and enter the possession of our brother's fair kingdom, blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. He says, and when our heads shall find the weight of the eternal crown of glory, and when we shall look back to pains and sufferings, then shall we see life and sorrow to be less than one step or stride from prison to glory. And that our little inch of time suffering is not worthy of our first night's welcome home. This is what Christ promises to his people. Blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. And so to him we give the glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these reminders of the promises we have in Christ. We thank you for the way in which you are at work in us to will and to do according to your good pleasure. We thank you that in the midst of your commands, you give us great grace. And we thank you for all these things, knowing that they come to us in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's in his name that we pray. Stand and sing the words of the Jude doxology. blessing of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.